Yarid, the tournament. It seemed that the further their carriage was from the keep, the more ruthless the cobbles below had fought, making their journey a rugged one through the streets of Hornhold. The air outside changed too. Once smelling of the rose gardens of the keep's grounds, now all that Yarid could get a whiff of was the horse dung and the moulded fruit of the market stalls. His cloak was soon pressed against his face, shielding him as best it could from the stench of his home's slums, riddled in beggars and harlots. The purple curtains remained shut. Yarid had no intention of answering to the calls of the city folk that lingered outside like vultures, each hoping to catch a glimpse of their lord's second son. Their voices called out in praise for him and his good health, wishing for him to have a thrilling time during the tournament ahead, one that he would oversee during his father's absence. He wondered why they prayed for him. He was no more than a stranger to Hornhold's people, just a name that happened to carry nobility with it. He would never stoop to his knees to implore the gods and wish for the health of strangers he did not know. Purple became a colour he was all too familiar with. It marked his great house and every banner that hung from the walls of his home, as well as lining every shield of his father's bannermen that marched alongside him on the journey. He'd gotten quite sick of it through the years. Its brightness made his stomach churn in times when it surrounded him, just like it was in the carriage he had been confined to. The Colours of House Usoro Across from him, sitting on the purple pillows that topped both seats, was Wymond, peeking out the slit in the curtain he had made with a small smirk on his thin lips. The man wore wrinkles across his face, his hair was a chalk white, and his jaw stood bold beneath his mumbling mouth. He too bore the colours of their house, draped in every shade of violet and lilac with garnets on his rings. He was his father's closest adviser and the man had been in his company long before Yarid came into the world. I'm sure your father is sad to miss this day, Wyman said, nodding to the onlookers with a subtle wave. That man loves a tournament, though he will be pleased to know you'll be present to give the contenders your favour, whichever man you may choose. His grandmother's funeral in the capital had called away his family to offer their farewells, leaving him as the only Usoro in Hornhold, after he convinced them he was too ill to travel. An old trick that still worked in his favour. They would not return for some days. He imagined they had already let his grandmother's ashes meet the wind, and they were now feasting for her memory. To be rid of his parents was a blessing in his own eyes, though he imagined his mother would not worry for his health between her grief for their loss. Her brother and sister followed them across Eskimar like sheep, being escorted by their own foolish duty that called them to Theron Thane. Lord Yarid, Wyman continued, moving his head to catch their gaze. If it were up to me, I would not wish to see a boy at the age of ten witnessing the grimness of this tournament. And yes, I understand that your father insisted, but you must know that you can choose to return to the keep at any time. I've seen men die before, Yarid sneered. It won't scare me. Wyman pursed his lips. Even so, you can look away if you wish. The terrace will be too high for anyone to notice. Does my brother look away? He asked, intrigued by the answer. Oh, certainly not. Duane is very fond of the tournaments. He's hardly missed any of the recent fights in the pits. I had hoped he would be present for your first visit, along with your father. Yarid cocked his head. I don't need anyone to be with me, and I won't look away, ever. I'm braver than Duane, you'll see. Very well, Lord Yarid. I should inform you of the men fighting today. There are only four in attendance, I'm afraid. Some of them wish to wait for your father's return, so they might have his presence. But your favour will be welcomed nonetheless. Yarid huffed, bored already of the journey. The first is Sir Ullen, Wyman began. He's attained many triumphs since taking the cloak, and has travelled many miles for this honour today. The man has fought a fair few battles through his life. Yarid watched Wyman's moving lips, but soon he could hear nothing from them, not caring for the words he was being fed from his father's closest adviser. The man spoke of the other entrance of the upcoming event, 
which Yarid did not even recognize as a tournament anymore. Four men, he thought, seeing it as more of a scuffle that was not worthy of his time or of ever being called a tournament. The three remaining men that Wyman spoke of had fallen on Yarid's deaf ears. He forgot them almost immediately, along with the first. His eyes turned back to the purple that was caving in around him, mocking him with a lilac bitterness. And then, of course, whichever man wins will receive both your blessing and their reward, Wyman finished, catching his breath soon after. What's the reward? Yarid asked, half interested. Ah, a lord's coin, of course, he told him, pulling out something silver from his pocket and holding it out in his palm. Every lord has their own mounds to give out to whomever they choose. Some lords give them to their servants after a long service, others to their guards. As for your father, he offers them to the men who prove themselves worthy in the pits when they fight in his name. Any man who holds a lord's coin will hold a new title of sorts, one that informs their peers that they have served a great purpose. It is a rare treasure I am giving to you, young lord. Yared thought it was stupid, taking the coin in his hand and looking down at it, running his finger along the distinct shapes of his house's sigil carved into the silver. An Edorian buffalo with its five horns stretched out to the coin's edge. He imagined gold would be better. He knew a pouch of it would make any man grateful, more grateful than any man could be after receiving a single silver coin with only a few different markings. Soon, the carriage had traversed the roughest ground of their journey through the streets before it halted, spawning the sounds of onlookers that had caught up to the carriage and were now swarming it, each a stranger cheering Yarid's name. Through the small curtain, he watched as his guards in purple cloaks had ushered them all away, with their brutish bodies acting like shields, clearing the wide path he'd soon take. You should smile. Wyman's told him before the door was pulled open. The two of them stepped out into the street that sat in the shadow of the pits. They were bordered by white stone that was smeared in fine-crafted pillars and, of course, the banners of Usoro. The city folk jumped and waved at the sight of him, each flashing their yellow teeth and shaking in their rags, calling for his attention like fools. That was what he thought of them. He almost resented their applause as if they were slandering him with curses. He didn't smile. Ahead of him stood his line of guards that guided him forward through the gates, holding their hands on their swords as they marched with identical paces. Wymond lingered behind him as his final company hurried to his side with shivering lips. Tibbin was his servant, at least the one who served him most, a boy only a year younger than he was. The two stood at the same height and both carried the faces of true Adorians, each golden brown beneath their heads of black hair. They could easily be mistaken for brothers if it weren't for their opposing attires. His servant's fingers were bare and bony, free of any rings, unlike Yarid's. There were many stairs to conquer. They soon made every pair of knees come close to buckling as they reached the peak, standing in the light of the early sun that lit up the purple canopy ahead. Yarod and his servant clutched their small legs that had met their match with the many steps, while Wymond did the same. Only his excuse came with his many decades of dusks and dawns, each of them turning him more grey and seasoned as they passed. The terrace stood higher than the chanters and cheering people below, they loomed beneath them in the oval-shaped ring of chiseled walls. It ran the entire way around the pit of flat sand in the center. There were cushioned chairs that bore the same color as the carriage, as well as tables and servants between them that each carried bowls of fruits that were being offered. His father's closest friends were present, some of them low-born lords or men rich enough to find themselves in his company. They each peered over the balcony's edge, poking out their pointed noses to catch a glimpse of the arena as they mumbled about their gambles. Should I fetch you some grapes, Lord Yarid? Tibbin asked in a whisper, already sweating as the cheers grew louder. Yarid shook his head, stepping forward to the chair that was obviously his to sit in during his father's absence. 
Wyman strode over to his side before joining the other nobleman at the edge, looking down at the stretch of sand as he had his subtle discussions, chuckling at their hushed words. Tibbin scampered away before quickly returning with a jug, one that Yarid had again refused. His only thirst was for the tediousness to come to an end. He wished for the fighting to begin soon so he could return to the keep. The buckle of his cloak clawed at his neck before he tugged it from his collar, throwing it to the floor, soon watching as his servant sprinted over to it, folding the silk in his arms and placing it neatly at his side. Yerid, Wyman called out, the champions are about to be introduced. A good lord must always receive them on his feet. At the sight of Wyman's wiggling finger, he stood from his chair and trudged forward, standing between two of his father's close friends who had not noticed him for some time. Gods, you gave me a fright, little lord, the one man said, clutching his chest at his short stature. This will be your first ever tournament, will it not? I'm very much looking forward to seeing which of these men you favor on this day. They each have their own ways with a sword. It will be a tough one to predict. Yarid said nothing in return, offering only a cold look before he turned back to the sand, watching as a single man stepped out with his arms raised, looking blessed by the presence of so many spectators. He recognized him. The golden dreads that hung to his neck had resembled the sand he walked on, wielding a grin wide enough to spot from the balcony. The pitmaster, Grenick Vane. He had often visited the keep to converse with Yarid's father about the men he had ready for an upcoming tournament. He'd let him place in early bets, or even meet the fighters directly. The spectators that surrounded him had begun stomping their feet, sparking a symphony of thuds that sounded almost like an army of drummer men on their way to war. The chortling men at Yarid's side stomped along, amused by the sight of the pitmaster's wild dancing as he kicked at the sand beneath his boots. Settle yourselves, Grenick yelled out gleefully, hushing them with gestures to put an end to their pounding heels. The pits were large enough to fit in a decent crowd. Yarid would have guessed there were at least a thousand watchers who took their seats, following the orders of the single man in the eye of the storm of dying cheers. He remembered how his father would speak of building a greater arena for the fights he loved so much, one that could fit half the city inside allowing thousands upon thousands to be entertained by the bloodshed. Yared slumped his shoulders, knowing another tiresome speech stood sternly between that moment and the tournament ahead. A fine day for a brawl, is it not? Grenick spoke beneath the cloudless sky, spinning on his feet to flash a smirk at every face that looked his way. And a finer day to receive a most welcomed guest— Lord you sorrow's own son, Lord Yarid, has come to offer his favour to a lucky fighter, and the privilege of his company to us. The crowd cheered again, turning their heads to look his way. Wave, Yarid, Wyman whispered. The Lord always waves. Yarid did as instructed, though his hand stood stiff in the air for a few short-lived seconds ahead of his stone-like face, unmoving to the praise of his father's people, before he recoiled once again. Grenick waited a moment, perhaps expecting Yarid to give a moving speech that his father was so infamously well known for. But no, he had no intention of addressing the crowd that watched him with intrigue. He was only there to witness the slaughter. Four men will fight on this day, the pitmaster continued, clear in his attempt to keep the moods of his onlookers high. Only one will prevail, a man who fights to please his lordship and every one of you fine folk. May the gods grant them courage and a grand victory. May their steel cut clean and bloody. Another cheer followed, one that almost became as continuous and bothersome as the colour purple. A new trouble to swarm not just his eyes, but his ears too. His teeth were already gritting from the formalities that were being spewed by the man he watched skipping around the sand. Are you ready to meet them? Grenick called out, soon to be greeted with the draining applause that he provoked again and again. Lift the gate! The sound of chains silenced the ring of people who sat tense in their seats. 
Yared stood on his toes and poked his head out forward along with the men around him, staring into the shadowy tunnel that stood as the final path three of the men would take in their lives. Yared wondered if that dwelled on them. He thought of how their mind may run with fear instead of the thirst for victory. Among the quiet air came the sound of shuffling steel. A figure in the darkness had soon emerged from the tunnel of black, revealing a man draped in armor with a sword and shield in his hands. He swung it ahead of him with a haste that urged a few gasps and the subtle clapping of hands. He moved with his blade like a lord dancing with a lady he courted. The armor held no crest of any noble houses. It remained bare and shimmering in the light of the sun that approached its peak. The only thing standing out on the brutish man was his helmet, one melded into the face of a horse, with steel ears and white hair sticking out from its scalp. A horse presents himself to Lord Yared, Grenick announced, letting the armoured man bow to the canopy before he stood with his arms at his back, still in his stance as he awaited his second fellow fighter. Sir Alan of Mudmere. The next man bore the same artless attire, though he instead carried a different beast on his head that flashed its steel fangs. A bear. He too spun his sword with a fiery passion, making the ladies flustered in their faces and urging the men to review their bets. Sir Riven of Yark, Grenick continued. Yarid remained expressionless, desiring the violence more than the theatrics. The third man was by far the largest. He had no need to flap his sword around him to get the attention he already demanded. His helmet was a rhino, one that looked uncomfortable to wear beneath the thick steel horn that sprouted out from it. He did nothing in his stride, simply walking forward to stand at his competition's side, bowing his head to Yarid and doing nothing more. The rhino before you, Sir Jake of the Capitol. Finally, the fourth man emerged, slithering from the shadow he left behind and slipping his slim sword from his sheath. The blade was thinner than a quill, but the man showed off its deadly talents as he scarred the sand beneath him, letting it spit into the air like spores as he sliced through it with a haste that matched no other. The snake, Grenick proclaimed. Sir Olius of Clamridge, your four fighters, each wishing for the favour of Lord Yared's gracious hand. They await your choice, my lord. Yared looked at the four men with a curious eye, marvelling at the calm stature that they each held, each of them knowing they would soon partake in a slaughter for the amusement of others. It was a strange thought to have, knowing that three of the souls ahead of him would soon be dead and lifeless on the sand, never to stand again. Your favoured pick will be followed by a wager, Lord Yared, Wyman uttered to him. If they are the last man standing, the winnings will be yours. I urge you to choose wisely. Your brother Duane always takes his time to assess his choices, and he has not lost once. Those words of his brother's luck were what drew him forward, squinting his eyes to evaluate the four figures ahead of him, wishing to prove himself more wise than Duane. He looked between the horse and the bear conjuring his thoughts of how a battle between them would unfold on the sands, how their fury would collide like a hammer on an anvil. He cursed at the men around him, who spoke in hushed voices, making their predictions and preparing their coins for their gambles, each so confident in their conclusions. He loathed them, but wished to have his own whispers of what he could foresee, though he saw nothing. The rhino and the snake remained perfectly still, the rhino had the greatest height and the largest shoulders of his company. He huffed like a bull, with darkened eyes that hid behind the steel. The snake was the slimmest, wielding slender arms that held pitiful muscles, ones unfit for a soldier with a title to his name. But the snake's entrance was swift, so swift that it lingered in his mind. Your adviser stands at your side if you wish to seek an opinion, my lord. Wyman told him from the silence, staring out with him at the many faces that looked to him patiently with intrigue. You know who's going to win? he asked, trying not to sound desperate in his tone. 
I cannot see the future, my lord, but I have attended many tournaments in my life, watching them proceed from both the benches those people sit on and the balcony on which we stand. I look at those men, and there is one who carries a certain habitus that I imagine will lead them to a triumph. Yared could not see whatever it was his companion was seeing, and he hated himself for it. Tell me which one. Look at the rhino, my lord, he told him. Look at his body, how much strength it holds. A beast on the sand, seeking out a slaughter. The eyes of a natural killer, lingering behind that helmet. Yared did look, just as he was urged to. He scouted the brawn he carried, and the wide frame that the crowd had cheered for when he first stepped out into the pits. He's too big, Yared mumbled. Pardon? Wyman questioned, leaning closer and crouching on his knees. He'll be too slow for the snake. He's too big to dodge him. Yared seemed convinced enough after thinking through his own words, staring at the man who looked to perhaps carry the weight of a real rhino under his thick armor. Soon enough, a girl with braided brown hair slipped out under the canopy with a swift bow, holding out her palms with a graceful smile. Wyman reached into his sleeves to retrieve a purple crest, one that had been sewn together with intricate care. He handed it to Yared with a nod. She awaits your choice of which man you have chosen to favor, Lord Yared, he muttered. He remembered the entrance of the snake, how he moved among the sand with a haste that no other man presented, each more sluggish when compared to the pit's final arrival. He thought of how the brute of a rhino would fumble in his stance when faced with an opponent who slithered in such a way, mocking him on nimble feet. Yared took the crest and placed it in the girl's palms, keeping his voice low when he spoke. I choose the snake, she smiled at him. A fine choice, my lord, she whispered back, bowing again before hurrying away back toward the stairs that led to the pits. Each of the men around him turned back to stare down at the four fighters, awaiting the reveal of Yared's decision. He stood once again in the center of them, hoisting himself up to the edge and standing on his toes as he always did, watching as the girl skipped forward to the center with the crest still in hand. Silence returned. The pitmaster stepped aside, letting the carrier of the crest come to a halt ahead of the four men, standing for a moment while the crowd held their breaths. And then she tossed it. The crest fell to the fourth man in line, landing at his feet on the sand, followed by a heavy cheer from the onlookers. The snake knelt down, picking it up and bowing to his lord, stuffing it into his chestplate. The snake has been blessed with the lord's favor, Grenick Vane announced to them, thrilling the crowd even more as the four men backed away from each other, preparing their blades. Three of them would fall in death for the act of yielding was no option for any man who dared to fight in a tournament in the pits of Hornhold. Several more girls draped in yellow silks had scattered between the many benches of the city folk who threw their coins their way. Three more had stepped out onto the canopy with their baskets, ready to collect from the gambling hands of the men who were certain in their foretelling of what lay ahead. The rhino will rip them each in half, one of them sneered emptying his pockets of silvers and writing his bet down onto the parchment the girl carried. That second one, the bear they called Sir Riven, he's from Yark, you fools, another added with a scoff. Those islands breed the best warriors this world has ever known. He'll gut your daft rhino with ease. Dozens of coins trickled down into the twin baskets, pulling down at the arms of the three little collectors that struggled to return to the stairs. But still managing to offer their bowing heads to bid their lord a farewell. I'm sure the snake will fight valiantly, Lord Yared, Wyman assured, leaning on his elbows with an affection for the brawl that grew closer. Did you bet on the rhino? Yared asked him, drowning out the sounds of the nearby men who had second thoughts on their choices. I do not gamble, he told him with a smile. My coin finds its way into more important baskets and pockets, ones that would lead to a homeless child having a meal for the night, or to a servant of yours that has worked tirelessly to bring you comfort. 
I found that money serves a greater purpose when it is placed in the palms of those who starve in squalor instead of fighting in combat. I would urge any soul, even a young lord like yourself, to follow a simple rule that I have lived by since the moment I knew the value coins hold. What is it? Yared asked as the bet collectors receded back into the tunnels. Wyman smiled. If given the choice to be either charitable or entertained, be charitable. His words seemed to carry a lesson in them, one that Yared did not pay much attention to once he heard him speak of it, already looking away from his father's advisor and staring down at the men that stood in their four corners. He clutched the lord's coin tight in his hand, hoping he would soon be tossing it to the snake and receiving his winnings. Though the money was the least of his concerns, for his father was no doubt one of the richest men in Eskimar. No, it was the thought of simply winning, having a victory to gloat of upon his brother's return to their home. Grenick hurried back to the center with an even wider grin, letting his golden dreads flail behind him as the crowd cheered for a slaughter. He did another stupid dance that spawned a few laughs before he cleared his throat, looking at his four fighters. In the eyes of the gods that have come to witness these men in their final breaths of valor and pride, we pray that you grant each of the fallen a safe passage to whatever lies beyond this life. Do with them what you will, but may it be merciful. Yared's head did not bow down with the others. He only clenched his fists, impatiently waiting for the blood to start pouring. He waited for the silent prayers to come to an end to watch the faces of the crowd turn from calm to callous, letting their lust for blood be displayed for all to see. They cheered, as if they took joy in casting aside the prayers they had just mustered, caring more for the sight of watching men die. Yared could not condemn their cheers for it, for he held more greed for gore than anyone there. Fascinated by how a man can change from a mighty warrior into a haul of meat and flesh in mere seconds. The pitmaster scurried away for the final time, escaping the clean sands that would soon be flooded with a dreaded kind of crimson rain, a downpour that would bleed from the wounds and blades that clashed above itself. Yared watched as Grenick held up his two greatswords, bearing a face of excitement and greed before he finally clanged the blades twice together, beginning the battle of the four men that wore the faces of steel creatures on their heads. The bear and the rhino ran for each other with heavy charges as if they were enemies before the tournament had even begun. Their blades struck against each other with a brute force, forcing people from their seats, ready to see one of them land a fatal slice or jab that would make one of them squeal like infant girls. Yared, kept his eye on his favoured fighter. The snake was cautious in his step, eyeing the stallion who gripped tightly to his iron sword, waiting for his time to pounce. Yared wanted to hear the squealing just as all the other watchers did. He wished to see the horse be reduced to a fearful child, standing in the shadow of an unmerciful snake before he lost his head. The horse shouted a slur that Yared did not hear but it held enough distaste for the snake to sprint his way, pointing his slender blade forward with a flame in his eyes. The two pairs of brawling men fought at either side of the pits, Yared's head cocked back and forth between them, focusing most on the man that carried his crest, while also being intrigued by the rhino and bear that clashed like beasts. Tibin shielded his eyes, whimpering at the sounds the swords had made, knowing they would soon be meeting flesh and spilling blood to the ground. Coward, Yarrod thought, disappointed in his timid servant that recoiled into the corner of the canopy, listening to his own soft words of comfort. The rhino led with the strength of five men, denting the armor of his opponent and roaring their way, scaring them with the torment he tortured them with. He had no fear or caution in his stance, looming over the bear as if it were a cub crying for their mother. The snake was the quickest man Yared had ever seen. He slipped by every lunge and slice the horse gave, gritting their teeth beneath their steel helmet. The snake had impressed everyone, and had more importantly proved Yared's choice was one to be admired. 
The snake was short, like he was. He held slender arms like Yarrett's, and a young face too. To see him win would feel like a victory he shared between the two of them. To mock everyone with the fact that the short and weak-armed men of the world can be the greatest of killers. The thin sword in his favoured man's hand soon found its chance, cutting through the air upon the horse's ill-judged lunge before it slit open the belly in front of it, landing between the small opening in the armour that had failed its wearer. The horse howled like a wolf and yelped like a puppy, shoving the snake away as he kicked at the sand in pain, looking at his bloody hands. A sudden strident cry cocked every head that watched the four-man battle. Yarid bit his lip at the sight of the bear, clutching the stump where his arm once was, though now it was a limbless horror that spurted out red onto the sand. The bear cried out for mercy that was soon ripped from him, along with his head from his shoulders. Three men with their hearts still beating. Wyman's face was turning pale and green at the sight of the decapitated man, though he was quick to shield his cheeks with his hand, hiding the true displeasures he had for such events. Yarid was quick to turn back to the duel to his right, watching as the snake chased down their prey, slicing at the flesh once more before sticking his thin blade right through the horse's throat. The defeated man collapsed to his knees, dying in the eyes of so many that had no care for his bloody gurgles, fighting for the air that had left him to his demise. Alone, breathless, and in the sights of the snake and the rhino that waited for his death to begin the final brawl. The body did not collapse like most did. The horse's corpse remained on its knees, their neck running with a stream of blood that spawned the second puddle on the sands, soon to be joined by a third. Yarid's morbid delight reached its peak. The snake should say its prayers, one of the men beneath the canopy uttered with a grin, scratching at their blonde beard. Shut up! Yarid spat at him, scrunching his face in a growl. The man bowed to the son of his superior. Sorry, my lord, he told him, hiding his wicked smile behind his hand of rings, chuckling with the other men as discreetly as he could manage. Wyman huffed, leaning closer to his ear. Timber, Lord Yarid, mind it well. Yarid did his best to unclench his fists, casting aside the scorn that had always so easily swarmed him. He could recall many times when his impulses would follow, leading to his own humiliation during his infamous outbursts. The body of the fallen stallion was kicked down by the snake's heel, landing on the ground with a thud and a clatter of his armour. Soon enough, the fight ensued. The two remaining men mirrored each other's speed and threw their attempts forward, missing each time, or being met with the thick armour they wore. The snake was the first to land a lethal hit, cutting at the flesh of the rhino's hand that held his thick sword, forcing him to drop it to the sand before it was kicked away. The rhino landed his punches to the snake's chest and stomach, not wincing from the knuckles he had surely brutalised. The snake was quick to get back to their feet, spinning briskly to let his narrow blade slice the rhino's ankle, bringing the wincing man to their knees. Yes, Yarrod thought, almost yelling it to every soul in the pits to gloat of his favoured choice. He took joy in watching the snake stab at the man's collar, before his thin sword was seized, sitting in the tight grip of the rhino's hands and pricking the flesh around it, letting blood stream down their wrist. The snake lunged his foot forward, striking the rhino between their unguarded legs before snatching back his blade, ripping away the flesh of his palms, leaving him with mangled fingers and bloody arms that made many watchers cheer. The crowd roared like an army when the snake landed his final strike, stabbing the rhino through the thigh, reducing him to tears and trembling. The tiny wound unleashed a swarm of red that made the onlookers certain of their victor, looking to the snake who stood proudly. As the man kneeling in front of him faced their nearing death, the snake reached for the laces of their own helmet, stripping it from his head and revealing his smiling face to the circling crowd. Young, olive-skinned, and holding no hair on his head. The man grinned at the applause. Yarid smiled, 
truly, for the first time that day, happy to see his favoured fighter on the edge of victory. Preparing his blade, steadying it for a quick stab through the throat of the silent rhino that remained on his knees on the ground. The brawn and bleeding man knelt with his fists in the sand, stirring it between his bloody knuckles before grabbing a handful of it with a burst of anger spewing from his lips. The rhino threw the sand ahead of him, letting the sharp grains ambush the snake's eyes and mouth. They spurted out coughs and curses as they clawed at their stinging eyes, whimpering and stepping back from the rhino that stood to his feet with a violent grunt. The rhino ripped the helmet from his own head, revealing a black-haired, pale man who charged forward. He gripped his steel horn and thrust it up through the snake's jaw, letting its sharp point emerge from the snake's skull, popping out his eyes, teeth, and mutilated brain all over the sand like rubble from a tower under siege. Yared's stomach seemed to swallow itself. The rhino ripped out his horned helmet, letting the butchered body of the snake fall to the ground, lifeless and massacred from his horrific efforts. The pitmaster clanged his swords together for a second time, smiling with the crowd who began their applause for their winning fighter that boasted of his strength to all of them, flexing his callousness and unbeaten stance. And so the rhino prevails, they called out, pleased in their tone as they approached the bloody beast. Yared's face scrunched together again, holding all of his fury in his gaze as he looked down at the dead snake. His tongue prepared its curses and its slanders, boiling with a hatred for the man who butchered his favoured champion, with his own helmet still dripping with their blood. Valiantly fought, Sir Jake, the pitmaster called, striding across the sand that was drenched in crimson, stepping over the maimed corpses without a single wince, dragging his two great swords behind him. Yarid felt his throat swelling, as well as his lips that yearned for an onslaught of foulness to be freed. The face of Sir Jake was a sinister thing, smothered in the blood of the fallen men, and the sweat from his brow making his cheeks shine. And now, a reward for your great victory, Grenick announced, pointing his hand to Yarid with a smirk on his face, patting the rhino on his brawn shoulder. My lord, Wyman muttered to him. The Lord's coin. You must toss it down to him. It is his token for his triumph. Yared felt the coin in his clenching fists, digging into his skin as he gritted his teeth, turning more red-faced and resentful as each second came to pass. He couldn't move for some time. He stood frozen in his stance as more and more eyes looked his way. My lord, Wyman continued intently. He cheated. Yared spoke softly, in a tone he could only hear, taking a step back from the canopy's edge, avoiding the gloating gaze of the last man standing. Yared, toss the man his token, Wyman told him, wary of the onlookers that watched Yared with curious eyes. It is a custom of these tournaments, no matter who the favoured fighter was. Yared shook his head, first softly, before he let his rage burn brighter. No! he objected, quivering at the lips and tearful in his eyes. He cheated! He threw sand in his eye because he's a coward and he knows he would have lost! He should have been killed and had his head cut off! He should be dead! Calm down, my lord, his adviser said, nearing closer to him with his palms raised. The fight was a fair one. Sajik has won this tournament and now you must give him his coin. Yared's infamous temper soon fractured spilling out the fire within. But he's a cheater! Yared cried, letting his tears trickle from his cheeks as he pushed Wyman's hands away, stomping his feet to the purple rug beneath him in a fit of anger. I should have won! The snake was the one I chose! The rhino is a coward and he should be dead! There were some gasps from the crowd, but mainly laughter as Yared's outburst unfolded. There came the pointed fingers and breathless mockeries from the hundreds of people that witnessed his childish fury. The men on the canopy snorted and chortled like fat pigs rummaging through their scraps, collecting their winnings from the girls in yellow who hid their smiling mouths from their maddened lord. 
With a callow growl, Yarod hurled the Lord's coin far in the distance, letting it land among the amused crowd who soon fought over it, digging through each other's shoulders and legs to retrieve the priceless token. The rhino stood, perplexed and bleeding, not laughing like those around him. I want him dead! Yarod howled, looking to the guards that lined the pits, each of them unmoving to his demands. Some of the spectators collapsed to their own feet, laughing at the floor with their red faces covered. Wymond looked stunned by such a display. He even seemed embarrassed, holding his cheeks that turned from green to pink. Yarid, we're going back to the keep right now, the old man said sternly. As his breath settled, Yarid saw the result of his petty choices and cries in the form of his own humiliation. The onlookers disgraced him with their taunting words, impersonating the fool they believed him to be in that moment, ridiculing their own lord's son. His lips tightened with spite, watching the mockeries continue, wishing he had every guard of the keep at his side so he could give them his grim orders. He demanded they kill every chuckling man, woman, and child, to rip their throats from their necks to see if they could still laugh without their gullets. He'd have them butcher the rhino. He'd gladly watch them rip him apart, punishing him for his cheating ways in the pits. He saw only enemies, nothing more. Yarid turned away, punching any wall or curtain in his path as his tears ran more down his face. The embarrassment and venom had coursed through him like a sickness brought on by a vicious poison, breathing a new strain of malice into him that would not retire for some time. He had shoved his tiny servant, watching as Tibin tumbled on his feeble legs, crashing down into the platters of tarts and grapes with a squeal. Soon, Yarid clawed at the hand that gripped him tightly, digging his nails into the old flesh like a beast fleeing its captor. Through his teary vision, he saw the blurred face of Wymond, who watched him with both shock and horror, blurting out words that were drowned out by the beating of Yarid's heart. He hadn't the strength to rip the dangling purple silks around him. He could only growl and cry, pushing away anything that tried to slow him. He wished he were a grown man in that moment, one with arms thick with a warrior's strength, as well as a longsword in his hand that he would use to cut down every smirker and giggler, silencing them forever.